All right, welcome everybody to our final segment of Sparks in the Dark online poetry. And I just want to give a special thanks and recognition to John Gillespie for organizing this series all these years, yep. so four years now. So today's poet is Anne E. Wallace, PhD, and she's the 2023-2024 Poet Laureate of Jersey City, New Jersey. As a longtime survivor of ovarian cancer, a woman with multiple sclerosis, and one of the nation's first long COVID patients, she has lived and written through illness for more than 30 years. Pain, disability, and disease as well as hope and resilience, have inspired and informed her work as a poet, memoirist, patient advocate, and scholar. Her new poetry collection, Days of Grace and Silence, a chronicle of COVID's long haul by Kelsey Books 2024, was written over three years, beginning with when Wallace was first sick with severe acute COVID and following her teenage daughters and her long journey of recovery. Wallace is co-host and co-producer of The Wild Story, a podcast of poetry and plants by the Native Plant Society of New Jersey and a professor of English at New Jersey City University. So welcome, Anne, and I will hand it over to you all. And I want to thank Rosemary. Rosemary has been doing all the behind the scenes promotion that you see on our website and everything. So she's she's the critical link for people visiting the site. So Rosemary, thank you. Obviously, I owe you a truckload of cookies. So I, I just have to purchase the truck, then I'll get the cookies going. Yeah. Thank you, John. Well, and <clears throat> you know, thank you for reading today. Um, you know, we always start as you know, what was your sense of our theme, Igniting Sparks in the Dark? Well, first, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be joining. Um, I should also add that I am originally from Massachusetts. So from the other end of the state, um, the beginning of Cape Cod, a little town called Marion. So it's always really nice to do events in Massachusetts or through um, collaborations with organizations there. Um. In terms of the theme, it really felt kind of perfect for me. I feel like my entire career has been about trying to um, find some kind of light and hope against despair, pain, suffering. In particular, I've been writing through illness for a long time. I not only have um, long COVID, which I'm doing really well with, but this collection that I'll be reading from today, Days of Grace and Silence, um, is about my COVID journey. But before that, I had ovarian cancer when I was in college. I graduated um, with my my hair fell out on my graduate, started to fall out on my graduation day uh, because I was already started in chemotherapy. And um, and I live with MS. So it's a it's been a, a struggle throughout my adult life to find that those sparks, right? Um, those sparks of hope, of brightness, of joy. And often we find them by looking closely and sinking into the things that do bring us hope and joy. And poetry is a really good vehicle for that because poetry asks us to slow down and to look closely and to listen. And all those things invite invite sparks, right? It's sparks as inspiration, but also sparks as just um, illumination that allow us to see from a different angle. Uh, and that's, I think, why really this this theme does speak to me quite dearly, quite closely. So I was, I you know, I feel a real special um, gratitude for being part of this series. Now, your journey is probably been one of the most challenging of anyone who have had on the show. So I, I appreciate your love of life sticking with it. Obviously you got the Jersey City thing going on. So that's that's uh that's a badge of honor. Thank you. 
Yeah, Perry, just like Rochester, you know, Buffalo. It's a, the you know, it's the badge of honor, Jersey. Yeah. Who lives in? Yeah, one of our friends. We lived in Cranford, New Jersey for 20 years. So, so we, we never went to Jersey City that much, but you know, all, all those those little cities by the water are fantastic. So so uh, why don't you share some of your work with us? Sure, absolutely. Um let's see. So I'll be reading today from my collection, Days of Grace and Silence, a chronicle of COVID's long haul. I also just wanted to um, forgive all the little post-its that make it kind of ugly, but the cover I love. It's by my friend Scott Redden, who is an artist, a painter, um, and I feel a lot of gratitude for him to him for letting me use his painting called Yellow Bluff on the cover of my book. I'm going to start with a poem called The Alchemy of Survival. The science was there in the chemo cocktail that dripped into me for five days each month, a regimen my body bucked and fought until the drugs were no longer needed. I grew strong, learned to see the world anew in the light refracted off the shards of my weary soul, and I fell sick again and again. Each time, I tinkered, trying to spark an ember from basest of metals, dark and lifeless, until the smallest flare of hope caught fire, and I bent over, cut my hands around the faint flame, and blew gently until it danced. Oh I chose gosh. that one, I think you might realize, because of the theme of this series. And I'm going to move to... Um, Another one from the ending of the book, and then I'm gonna take us back in time. This one's called Passages. It's been decades since my body held a narrative clear and simple. It turned to poetry long ago when a refrain emerged, was repeated with life interrupted once, then again and again. A poem always begins in the middle or someplace nearby because truly, have you ever tried telling a poet to begin at the beginning? When my doctors ask me or my daughters how our illnesses began, oh, the poems we compose on paper-lined examination tables. Each one of us a stanza braided to the other, to the other, with no beginning and no end. The poet in me dares not ask if we are always muddling around in the endless looping middle of this story. How might we ever write our way out? And this book is my attempt to do that. It's a chronicle. So it's written almost like a journal or a diary with the entries dated um, and in order. So I'm going to take us back into a moment that I think globally was a moment of darkness for most of us to spring 2020. And that's where this collection begins. But we'll try to write our way out, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. I'm going to begin with my, in it, you know, I write generally, I tr most years I try to write a poem a day in April for National Poetry Month. And I was very sick in April 2020. I was on bed rest. I'd already been in the emergency room a few times with COVID, but the hospitals were full. So they sent me home and basically told me don't move because if I tried to stand, my oxygen levels would drop. I had trouble speaking. I had, um, intense pain throughout my body, terrible head headaches, a lack of a lack of focus, a lot of brain fog. So by April 1st, I was already a few weeks in and my daughter had been sick before me and was still struggling. Um, but on April 1st, I thought I'm going to try to write a poem a day and we'll see how this goes. So here's April 1 for the house finches. I wonder if the house finches know they own the yard this year. The cheery red-headed finches, the cardinals, sparrows, morning doves, and the large lone pigeon who began visiting last week as I fell ill to peck beneath the feeder. All of them. They can have the yard this year, I think, as I heave myself off the couch, slip my feet into my empty red boots, pull a shawl around my shoulders, and stumble outside to offer them some food. The next day, I wrote this one called Airborne, which will take you a little bit into what this felt like. Each breath, breath, 
beating breath, sucks in the thin air. Exhaustion floods the pulse, pulse, slow pulse of the exhale, a wave of light, of blue, then dark, sways inside my head, floating right, floating left, around, around, around. So you had enough energy, you know, during April 2020 to to write and keep at it? I didn't have much. Um, some of my poems from that month are three lines long, uh, but I did do it every day. It was really important to me to do it. Um, it almost was uh, like an assertion I was still here. And I wanted also to create a record. I wanted both for myself, but also I, I didn't know how large this pen, I mean, it was a global pandemic by then. We knew that. I didn't know how long it would last, but I thought I have this, um, I'm, th I'm right in the middle of it. So let me try to write through it and see where it takes me. And I could not write essays. I tried, but I couldn't compose paragraphs, but poetry was manageable because a poem doesn't necessarily have to have a lot of logic or <laughs> I mean it can't you know a poem can be so many different things that offered a lot of opportunities this next one's called April Mud from April 9 and I live in in Jersey City it's right across the river from Manhattan so um this tells us a little bit about New York and you know we're right in the in the heart of a lot of horrors here April mud. I sat in my yard today for the first time in weeks. No, the first time this spring. And as I sat, a light rain spattered around me. I sat a little longer, feeling the sky darken, the shadows grow sharp, and the birds sing more brightly as spatters turn to drops. While I sat, men on Heart Island in airtight hazmat suits worked side by side in the rain digging muddy trenches for fresh pine boxes. The man on Heart Island buried last month's dead who waited two weeks alone, unclaimed, together in city morgues, filled past capacity to be interred in plain boxes on a wet April day while the birds in my backyard sang. The safety within. We dwell in this quiet house sealed tight from a world grown unfamiliar over long breathless weeks. Dry hot battles have waged within these walls each day won or lost with a steady flood of oxygen to the rise and fall of body temps and the tight burn within my chest. These battles are small and also life and death. But four weeks in, the terror has grown familiar. Beyond the walls of my chest of the beating hearts in this house grows untamed terror, destruction that we do not yet know, that has laid bare, will still lay waste to my neighbors, my friends, my city, and so far beyond. And as we recover strength and stamina here inside and plot our return, I have begun to fear the vast weeping silence we will find outside. Blessed be. Before I start this one, I should say that my my fiance, um, my partner for many years, Constantine is a funeral director. So while I was sick and quarantined here with my daughters, he was living another kind of horror. And, and that word is not too, too, it, it is hardly strong enough, I should say. It was truly horrific um, with the funeral calls that he was getting round the clock um, day after day after day. And this is a, a poem about one of the calls he received. Blessed be. The woman watched as her husband took his last breath. They were together, but it is small comfort to die at home during a pandemic. There was no peace for the man who left his wife sick, frightened, alone with no money for a funeral, no money for someone to come and take his body. 
There was no solace for his wife when the police came, noted her loss, and left. Her illness, her grief, her love lying still in their bed. There was too little left for a family that has nothing but love holding it together. There is no comfort in dying at home during a pandemic. So do you well, say your part your partner is an opera singer? No, he's a funeral director. <laughs> What's that? A funeral director. Oh well, let's say you know it's kind of in the same genre. <laughs> there's a lot of singing. There's a lot of. Uh, he's a funeral director. I I don't know if that was a good, uh, you know, role model at home. Ugh. Yeah, we don't live together, so um, oh. and we we didn't see each other. We live a couple miles away. We didn't see each other from March. 9th until early June um, because of my illness and and his work and his constant exposure um it was very yeah funny. yeah um while I was sick I was also teaching so I wrote this poem to my students I was teaching online asynchronously very low and en low energy um they were all in crisis too some of them were sick as well um to my students in the time of the novel coronavirus I know you are struggling that you have, you, let me try that again. I know you are struggling that you had already fought and kicked to make it to spring break to the week when we would all come up for air before the final push of a hard semester. But break this year was a last gasp right before our class was sliced into two, into before, into after, when the fragile balance of everything you were holding together while holding your breath shattered as if a cat had walked across the shelf where your most precious things pieces were perched and casually swatted them one by one to the floor we are stuck here frozen staring at the glassy shards knowing we cannot scoop the thousand pieces into our hands and mold them into january or february when life was sharp and fragile but not broken I know you are struggling, and though I will not tell you this, I know you will continue to struggle. So much has shattered. I will not tell you because you are surrounded by shimmering dust that reflects off your face in ways you could not see before. And for every piece of you that has broken, a new angle has become visible. And what I know is that you are present and fighting, and that though you are struggling, you will not be broken. Hmm. Um, if I had a choice, I would have picked the flash and danger of the fire eater who swallows the flaming torch and snuffs it out to riotous applause as it plunges from mouth to throat to lungs over the deadly burning inhale of this novel coronavirus. So Ann, are you done with are you done with long COVID now or is it still lingering? I I'm mostly done with it. I'm doing a lot better, but um I have days that I spend on the couch still because um I don't feel good. And um when I get sick, I get sick for a lot longer than would be normal. If I get a cold, I might be sick for the month rather than a few days. Uh but more significantly, my daughters also have long COVID and my younger daughter has been very sick for 18 months. She missed half of her junior year and most of her senior year. She just graduated, um, but I'll get to that as we go yes. a little longer. But um, yeah, it's been very devastating, honestly. Wow. But there is, uh, but I, I am doing so much better. I can go to the gym, I can run, I can lift weights, I can do things that I absolutely couldn't have done in 2020. Um, so I'm going to take us to a couple more poems from 2020, but I will say, you know, I started with the dark, <laughs> but it will get lighter as we go, especially after we take the little break. So let me just read it. I'll read a couple more. And then I think we take a little breather. Is that? I think yeah, I have we have to have at least 5% of light during the program. That's right. No, we will. Amanda, you just made it up. Amanda, you're like a 90% light when you read. Harry's so, always like, yeah, guy, you know, yeah, you got to have, we'll uh, 
<laughs> we have to manage the light dark ratio or I we're know. not in compliance well, I, with some. I, I tried to like go dark and then we'll get to the light. So we'll find those sparks. So spring song, the sirens wail the soundtrack of this silent, silent spring, a keening intertwined with bird song by day with my daughter's dry, dry cough through the night. Life and death bound together contrapuntal on and on so that I no longer hear the sirens until I do. Special delivery. An oxygen tank arrives today by special delivery. Now I recover. And not yet, Abby, from the end of April, 2020. And then again, with the second half, I will not, I'll, they'll be spread out more and um, have more lightness coming in. But this is a little anecdote about my daughter, not yet, Abby, in the form of a poem. When my youngest was just three, maybe four, I took her to the dentist one morning in early November. Before we left the house, she picked a bright red lollipop from her Halloween bag and held it out posing a silent question. You can't eat that now, Abby, I said as I lifted her into her car seat. She held it tight in her small fist as we drove, left it safe in her cup holder when we went in for the cleaning. Back in the car, she held, it, she held up the candy. Now, Mommy? Not yet, Abby, I replied as we drove to her preschool. I left her chattering with her friends and went to work. Half past five, I rushed back to the little school. As I walked through the heavy front doors, I saw she'd been waiting. She ran to me and held out her tightly curled fist, palm up. She unrolled her fingers to reveal the red lollipop still in its wrapper. Now, I laughed, yes, but let's put your coat on first. A decade later, Six weeks into a pandemic, Abby quietly opens her bedroom opens her bedroom window and slips outside to sit in the afternoon sun, perched in the safety of her fire escape. At 13, she already knows the answer to the question she has not yet bothered to ask. Not yet, Abby. I will end um, this, maybe this is kind of the end of this section. Let's see, um, in abundance from spring 20, uh, sorry, summer from August of, of 2020. And I'm in an online writing group. Uh, it's called the Any Good Thing Writing Challenge. And um, in 2020, obviously everybody was trying to keep each other, um, their morale up and their writing moving forward. And I would, I remember at that time, somebody wrote that she was writing from a place of abundance. And I thought, I don't even know what you're talking about. What, what abundance? This is August, 2020. I have none. And the more that I thought about it though, I realized I did have a lot of abundance. And, and so like thinking about that theme of sparks in the dark, we just need to find it. We need to look for it because yeah. We almost always have it. We almost always have something to be grateful for. And that is a spark in our life. So this is called an abundance. This winter, spring, summer has been a long haul of suffering and silence, of sick bed days on repeat, with life pared down to its essence. My attention focused on the fragile act of breathing in, then out, for four beats, in, out, speaking, cooking, bathing, hefty efforts to be weighed each day, any one jettisoned for the other. Yet amid the scarcity, a stream of love, of care, has flowed to my small and quiet place within this solitary house of quarantine. So, Ann, why don't we take our break right now? Sure, Let's. Um, that makes sense. Sounds good. Uh, you know, Laura, you haven't been on the show before. I think everyone else has. So, Laura, what we what we usually say is, don't let the poet off easy. This is your time to ask the tough questions. I mean, Amanda survived it. Perry, Guy, they 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 went through it. The gauntlet. <laughs> no, it's all very friendly. Amanda, I keep encouraging people to like you know go crazy, but no one does it. 
So next so, season, Perry, be all crazy. <laughs> Go ahead. So what you take a, a break and ask the poet questions? Yeah, we just then... questions or comments and a little audience interaction. Yeah. Okay. So Anne, I I, I really enjoy what what you're doing here and, and the journey and, and that it's a journal. I didn't realize that. Um so this this happened during 2020 and got published in 2024. Is there something new in the hopper that you're gonna be? Oh, um, absolutely. Well, this book does take us through um the beginning is intensely spring 2020, but then the poems actually go through spring 2023. I write less frequently, but I still, but that's when I get into the long COVID, but also I can, the, a lot of the poems are more reflective in the second half uh, or actually the, the final, yeah, it's really the second half of the book. So it does take the, the poems were written over three years, but um, in terms of what's new, I do have a new poetry collection I'm putting together. I have lots of poems that aren't about the pandemic and a few more that are, but that will be in a new collection and I have to compile that. I've been pulling them and revising, but uh, that's in the hopper. And I'm also working on a memoir of illness um, that again, memoir, like these are written in the moment while I was sick. And, but a memoir allows me to step back and and make connections in a way that the poems don't and mm -hmm. reflect in a different way and add things like dialogue and build scenes. Um, so that I've been working on that as well. And then, that sounds good. That sounds thank like you. Yeah, thank yeah. Thank you. No, I, I'm glad I, I'm glad I, I was able to, to participate. I'm so glad you joined. Thank you. Um, Anybody and else? And yeah. I wanted to say, I have a friend who, her name is Brienne, and she also works a lot. Um, she does painting and poetry and like some other things, but she uh, works a lot around the themes of illness and um, and grief. And I wondered if I could connect you with her or, oh, yeah, because um, yeah. I, I, I just think that, um, you know, you could reach out to her or, you know, I can tell her about you if you could put like your in, you are you on Instagram and then oh yeah oh okay I, yeah I, yeah okay yeah I'll try to connect you too because I think like you guys could have some good conversations I would love that thank you yeah. and I'm yeah. putting great Instagram too thank you yeah thanks yeah her name her name is Brienne I'll I'll um I'll see what I can do there wonderful anybody else I have, I have a question. Um, I haven't had a chance to ask a question in several months, so I, I'm going to take advantage of this. And uh, uh, for um, I'm familiar with uh, with some of Anne's work, and I've never asked this question before. But I, Anne, when you're when you set out on the uh, idea about writing, trying to write every day, and uh, at probably the darkest point in the you know one of the darkest points of time. How did you, I mean, how did you actually, how did, how did you go about that every day? Did you, did you get up with that determination and just get at it at the table or did you kind of let the day kind of build on you or, or I'm in, I'm curious about the writing, your writing process to keep you kind of going day to day like that. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I, I definitely didn't write at a table. I wasn't really well enough to sit at a table most of the time. Uh, so I, I lived on my red couch for the most part. Um, I would come downstairs and that's where I would in the morning and I would be there and because I could re get to my fridge for water or snack, but I couldn't prepare meals. And um, so I just needed to be close to, you know, I could make a piece of toast or a bowl of cereal. Um, so I, I was in my living room and I had my laptop and I did not write first thing. It took me mornings were really, really hard. Uh, it was nights were terrible and mornings were also terrible. So I generally wrote later in the day and I wouldn't let myself go to bed until I had done a, written a poem. Um, in April, after that, I loosened up my regimen um, and wrote when I had something to write. But yeah, I wrote on my, I wrote on my laptop and um, it was very much a laptop, laptop, like as in it was in my lap. 
and and just tried to do must you know pull out whatever I could and sometimes I was inspired by the news like the men on Heart Island burying the dead or by stories that constant you know things that Constantine was experiencing or I would just sink into whatever I was experiencing at that moment so I tried to it, actually it wasn't an effort of what I was trying to write about I just wrote through whatever was on my mind and there was a lot on my mind but I know I'm not alone in that <laughs> so. yeah the Heart Island poem is just such a wonderful uh wonderful poem it's Thank beautiful you. thanks but it also really that was the deaths the bodies the bodies were on my mind because Constantine was handling them and they had to go to Lowe's at his funeral home and buy Lowe's the hardware store and buy six foot folding tables to put bodies on because they didn't have room in the funeral home they I think they had some spread across chairs because um I mean and they were not alone this <laughs> at all um so that that was on my mind a lot of these bodies in the hospitals and in the refrigerated yeah. trucks but people thought once they were out of the refrigerated trucks that was like problem solved that wasn't at all the case they they're they weren't being buried they weren't being cremated um and it yet there were the backlog was so great in this area so that, that was something that was very heavily on my mind yeah, amazing yeah, thank you thanks mike mike and i are in a, a group together poetry group we meet once a once a month on zoom <laughs> so, and i'll see you sunday <laughs> i didn't know that's <laughs> good that's when we're meeting <laughs> yes um should I, I'll, I guess I'll move forward with another batch of poems. Yep. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> yep. So, um, leaning into the, the sparks theme sparks in the darkness. This is called the anatomy of a storm. The way Minnesotans know snow deep, intimate, without fear is a lesson on living through the squall of these middle years. Some day, some years, sorry. Some decades are winter through and through, but after a spell, we build a home within the storm, nestle under the crystalline shards, light a match against the too early dark and stop waiting for the sun. Thanks. Um, this piece is called Enamel. It's from winter 2021 and it is about, um, a, a body that a woman whose funeral Constantine was handling and he asked me to help with. Enamel. I held her hand cupped within mine, her brown fingers curled in permanent rest as I applied a fresh coat of enamel to her nails. I did not know the frail woman in the casket, though I wrapped her body in the fine sari her family brought, pulled silver bangles onto her wrists and brushed her hair. And I held her cool hands in mine as I painted her nails, wondering when her skin had last been touched in life and without worry. And I thought of the long viral months when my skin too was untouchable. And I pressed the warmth of my palm into hers. Right, she sorry, died of COVID. Yeah. Synesthesia. I was thinking about hungry birds and spring and the returned fever of my daughter, but these things do not inspire hope. So her sister suggests music and plays a song she says is orange and pink and sounds like a painting. And now I know we both hear color and texture when others are stuck listening for the words. Sounds will carry. How old are your daughters? How old are your daughters now? They are now in the pandemic began. They were sixteen and thirteen. They're now twenty and seventeen. Um, oh. And my my sixteen year old who got sick before me in March twenty twenty, her long COVID symptoms um, really kicked into gear in month thirteen of her illness. So that's what that returned fever of my daughter is referring to. Um, Sounds will carry. This one I wrote for the long COVID community and for those who lost people to the pandemic. Sounds will carry. 
We have pulled at thin air and breathed in the shallows, hungry, our hearts and lungs ablaze, commanded ourselves to breathe and breathe some more. Our breath sounds swallowed by the wail of sirens, on and on, the fear stuck in our throats has now crescendoed into the guttural cries of a nation in grief. But we have laughed as we have cried, and we will laugh and we will cry some more. And the sounds will carry us like calling cards of the lost and bereft across the bridges and through the cities in search of each other. Mm. New Driver is about my older daughter, um, written in spring, tw summer 2021. So again, her COVID symptom, her long COVID symptoms were bad that summer. But New Driver, this is about Molly. Walking like breathing is not yet easy. Last year, the TikTok of teenage progress came to an unwelcome stop, and the world closed up as my daughter and I fought for air. But as spring gave way to the steady warmth of June, we reemerged together to make our way, halting up and down our mile long street, counting our breath in and out checking oxygen and speaking of times ahead, waiting on our return. Our long illnesses relapse and persist, and I am trying with my small energy, each day walking up and down our street. My daughter, though, she drives now, away, away from Ogden Avenue. And reminders of our long virus. And in the car, it is easy to forget that walking still holds the power to take her breath away. I'm a gardener and um, I also host a po podcast called The Wild Story, a podcast of poetry and plants. Um, so I'll put in a little plug for that, but I am a gardener and in this, when I was sick, I wasn't able to garden, but I was watching my friends and I was envious, I will say that, but I was watching and seeing how their gardens and their approach to nature changed over time. My Facebook feed tells me that milkweed and butterflies are this year's sourdough bread and backyard chickens. As the pandemic has turned our attention from life that must be needed and tended each day and in earnest, filling solitary days one after the other with small tasks and gratification that is in sight but does not come quick or easy. A year in, we take a breath and make space for the wild things that pollinate and multiply when we step aside and let them be, reclaiming once manicured city slips of greenery as the early pandemic bakers and hen handlers now relax into gathering seed pods for next year's bees and planting parsley for the swallowtail caterpillars to munch, each doing its job without ado as we learn to withdraw our heavy hand. Mm. Thank you. And I have, uh, let's see, one of these I already read. Ties that bind. This illness breaks me into three tied and tattered threads, mine, hers, theirs. A long narrative that ruptures, compounds once, then again, just when we thought it was all coming to its overdue post-viral close. One mother, two daughters, three years apart in birth and now in illness. Nothing alike, but in this wretched timeline, 16 is an age of possibility spoiled and spoiled again. This ending remains out of reach, and it does not resolve with an easy breath or a wish blown upon a candle. As a counterpoint to that, I will read this poem that's not in my collection uh, about my younger daughter when she got sick. It's called What is Here? There is sweetness here in this year of pain and solitude, a burrowing punctuated by silliness and love. Sixteen here is a year of interruption, an unintended break in this steady march toward adulthood, a hibernation at home for rest and healing, and the unexpected gift 
gift of mother-daughter time, when each day cycles through appointments, sleep, food, healing, and not much else, ever cycling toward, away, and toward teenage recovery. You know, having sick children, teenagers, is it is really, really hard, but I but the unintended, unexpected gift is that I feel like I became really close with my. Sorry, really oh, close with my. That's nice. It just it, it's something I never would have expected um, as a consequence of something so terrible, but it is true, and I can't deny it. Um, and I want to. Ha I have gratitude for that. Um. No, we're no. good. We're good. And okay, I'm capturing all the, uh, I'm just a, the chat, okay. the chat I comments. I'm checking that time because yeah. I don't want to run long. Note to self, two kindnesses or one. This is from, from spring 2023, so a year ago. And when I wrote a, one last flurry of poems <laughs> that ended up in this collection as the closing. And it, it really did bring this book to a more hopeful ending than it might have if it had found a publisher sooner. <laughs> so I'm grateful that it took a little time to, to find uh, that publisher. Note to self, two kindnesses or one. Do you get as frustrated as I that some lessons do not come easy or fast, that there are things we know deep in our bodies that we have learned through trial and error and error and error, and yet we must learn them again? I know you, I think you know, this feeling of carving out space, of creating sanctuary within your home, your body, of finding the necessary beauty of silence, then inviting the noise to rush in when a friend calls for help. I struggle here to find the line between kindnesses, between being a good human and being good to myself. And truly, why did these things feel at odds? And how might I lift my gaze upon myself if I held a line here between you and me? But what I really want to say is that I think our needs are mutual. And that maybe this note to self is a reminder to ask for help in claiming silence. The empty casing. Imagine this. If you have planters of parsley or dill growing outside in a sunny spot, odds are good that you have tossed butterfly eggs onto your pasta with the garnish or mixed them into your salad. Just imagine. Have you ever seen the egg of a butterfly? Before caterpillar, before chrysalis. The minuscule sphere, a perfect glassy orb deposited by swallowtail or monarch or fritillary and perched so delicately on a leaf or the whisper thin stem of your garden herbs. I saw my first last summer. I watched the brilliant swallowtail. She visited daily for a spell found my bed of parsley. I searched for a week, leaf by leaf, until I spotted it, one perfect egg. How small, how fragile, how large my hands, my garden shears. The egg stood such small chance against a quick snip at mealtime, small chance against hot sun that can wither a wispy herb into the parched earth over a few dry days of drought. It's truly a wonder we have any butterflies at all. But my patio egg, it defied the odds. It hatched under my protective gaze, grew fat off the parsley I did not eat, spun a home around itself. I watched and waited as it grew strong. Then one morning I found the empty dry casing still stuck to the side of my clay planter. The butterfly, it was gone flown away into its new life. So Anne, what did your daughters think about your poems? Did um, they, uh, did they weigh in on? They, they did, they had not weighed in. I think they, I think they're proud of me for writing them. So they like the fact of them. My younger daughter is a writer. She probably reads more of them than my older daughter so much, but um, but they're very supportive. And I try not to share things both in my prose writing and in my poetry without about them without clearing it with them, unless it's something yeah. sort of 
I know that they'll be okay with. Um, yeah. But specifics, I try to to leave out, especially specifics about say their struggles um, that are personal or you know that they might feel yeah. that they might feel are a violation. So um, I do I do share things that with them. Yeah. Nice. And I will end with um, maybe just two more. Spring rain. Last fall's dried leaves quietly snapped and crackled on the forest floor. Yes, like cereal and milk. I knelt, placed my ear to the earth and listened. A rain too light to feel was falling, faintly popping against the brown and brittle leaves. I held out my open palm, nothing. But the ground continued to speak and a moist loamy scent lifted in the air. I inhaled, raised myself up, and soon the drops came fat and fast enough to touch. Mm. And I will end with The Infinity of Hope, and that's the last um, poem in the collection. We talk a lot about the little things, the ripple of a stone in the glassy surface of a lake, Circles pushing out and out and out until they join other waves and circles, each a disruption that begins with the weight of an object thrown, or a body, say, of a dragonfly landed where before there was none. We talk a lot about the little things, the small decisions or delays that mean you and not me, or me and not you is in the wrong or the right place at the wrong or the right time. We used to call it chaos theory, the way one small action here has grand potential to impact you, wherever, whoever you may be. Sometimes the ripples, they are devastating. The wave of one airborne particle heading toward me and mine, the way we might think an action is harmless because we do not think to look where the stone lands where the ripple travels, because we are so mesmerized by the rings expanding with perfection upon the smooth water. But other times, the impact of the small things, it is beautiful, a kindness or surprise that spreads like a ripple into a smile, a day set into motion, expansive, unknowable, with potential that is infinite. So tell me, what small ripples will you release into the world today on faith that you may not see what stuck things they loosen? Nice, very nice. Yeah. Anybody have any final comments or questions? I'll just say that the uh, pandemic poems I like actually that part in the last poem where, you know, the little particle coming in waves. But I was getting really anxious listening to your reading. <laughs> I, was, I was getting anxiety and it was really bringing it back for me. I mean, I think I'm still dealing with, you know, it's been four years, a little over four years now. And I'm in New York, mm -hmm. upstate New York, but, you know, the rest of the country wasn't understanding what was happening here for yeah. a while. They just did not. It was like, huh? What? Yeah, I have friends in the Midwest because I'm actually from Minnesota. And they were just like, huh? What? You know, it didn't seem like that big of a deal to them. And they're still going off and doing stuff. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know? I, yeah. And it's still affecting my life just in terms of going out and doing things i'm still pretty reluctant and anyway it was very you're reading those poems are very affecting and thank you i think i've written one poem you know that i would call a pandemic poem but it also focused me on writing a lot about what was going on in my own yard literally mm -hmm. um so i guess in, that, in those terms it was kind of affecting me as well but, uh, well, I mean, I feel like that's a sort of gift in itself, right? That that sort of turn toward focusing on what matters, which I'm assuming would be your, you know, that sure. you're, it, it's yeah. different of life and finding and observing that life. What's right in front of you, you yeah, know, and, exactly. and, you know, certain 
priorities too in, in mm -hmm. one's life you know and I'm, I'm sorry you and your daughter had to go through what you went through but I'm glad you were able to write about it thank you um and thank you all for going on this journey I know those early poems are not easy to listen to they're not easy for me to to read I'll be honest um there are poems in my collection that I've never read out loud because I know I can't um they're too hard they're too you know they're they just they're too painful um maybe i'll get there sometime but i think i i don't i don't think you're alone in feeling like you, you, this is still with you right i think that most of us we all want to move on right we, we want to but yeah. we, we don't i mean this was global upheaval and pain and suffering and we get there in our own time and in our own way well i commend you for the bravery in writing about them and sharing them Thank you. Appreciate it. And that was a wonderful reading. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and John, I, did, I wanted to say thank you for doing this for four years, because I have really, really enjoyed my, my lunchtime with you people and met some really nice people, too. It was a great thing. Now we're going to reinvent the program for season five so yeah well i'll be around hopefully yeah, i'm searching I'll for co-conspirators so be here. Uh, no no with the uh, what do you call it it's remember that song the day the music died whatever that remember that song back in the so, yeah. yeah well there's no day that poetry dies so yeah. i'm good you know it's got a lot of energy it's another one it. of those yeah. like unexpected wonderful things that happened during COVID and I and of course I don't ever say to this to diminish to, to diminish the the horrible things that ha have happened but the fact that like a program like this moved online like developed online and brings people together from mm. wherever they may be it's really so fantastic mm. not not to be understated you know like that, that that's a gift in itself Perry 184 poets 150 readings wow uh well yeah no it's, it's i've been to a lot of them so. i know i know you're um i don't know should we have merit badges or something we need i, well, I i'm i'm sure there's I'm, like a little trophy store online guy that i can get i, I think now, kathy haley has the record for most true. things attended true. she I'm must surprised. have like 25 so i'm surprised yeah i might get well an award for being the the farthest away maybe i don't know yeah buffalo well we've got some people on the well amanda's in texas wow okay you know, guys you, in upstate, you, you know you you win amanda you win is is there a mailing list or something or that you can join? i can if you send put your email address in the chat okay I can add you test um yeah i think next time when we do it we'll have this registration so we can capture the email addresses and just keep yeah. the mailing list updated. Yeah. This is kind of, I do postings on LinkedIn and we do posting on the library website. So yeah, just put your, your email address. I'll add you to the list. So this is the last show of season four. So season five, you know, tentatively scheduled to start the first week of October. We kind of go October through June. Hmm. So uh, yeah. 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 Now, Perry, this has been a blessing for me. I'll tell you that. This has been, as I call it, plugging myself into the poetry wall. I get very charged up and I need to be usually sedated after these uh, readings because mm -hmm. I'm too excited. So uh, <laughs> well, that's I, great. I enjoy it. I really enjoy yeah. it. Well, you started it up right in the heart of the pandemic, I remember. I mean, that was tough. That was tough. <clears throat> well so, there are a lot of people at home so we would have 35 or 40 people per reading and then eventually i don't know what's going on people went back to work i don't know what that means they're having lunch they're doing other things and not doing you know listening to poetry and i, I you know the world the world's tilted back to its re you know it's yeah. prior reality again you know, I, work, I have a poem I didn't read lunch. called Standing in a Different Place, which is about the world tilting on its axis. And yeah. um, and I have too, but differently. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, good. We're just about here at the end. Ian, thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your journey. Um, you know, Guy, I've got my own little, little, you know, nagging medical issues, but I don't know. There are certain things, uh, I have this post-pneumonia kind of cough and symptoms. They're just certain things, that, uh, Guy, that I can relate to your, it kind of brings back some of the fear or the yeah. unknown. It kind of creeps back in again. And I think that's the, that's part of the scary part to capture in. You know, it's, it's that not knowing. Yeah. There is no normal day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Day after day after day. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, and I had put in the, in the comments that it almost reads like a historical document. And that's, that's so important to have captured, you know, the emotions of, of what, what happened, you know, when people go, reflect back, you know, even now, four years from now or five years from now or 10 years from now. Yeah, I had, um, I had, I hadn't really thought of it exactly that way, but I, I do study, um, as a literary, you know, I'm an English professor and I do literary scholarship and I study illness literature uh, in part because I am a cancer survivor and have MS. So my focus is on, was already on like literature of illness and how people write their way through illness. And so when I got sick, that was part of why I thought I have, I, I have to create this record. I have to write through this because I don't, because this matters to me. This is, I felt like I'd been in training almost in some kind of strange, strange way. Um, so that also motivated me that like knowing how important these stories can be and not knowing that like I don't me that say that to like plug my own writing but I mean just knowing that we need multiple records and um yeah so that that yeah. was part of what drove me as well well good yeah I'd agree very good and I have uh copied all the chat Oh, great. I'm, I'm writing down oh. people's email addresses and info. <laughs> so if you see me like, looking sort of distracted around the screen, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> well, I, I use the Zoom uh, I you know, transcript, creates a transcript. Yeah. I had a, a one hour call with a friend. We're writing an article about reinvention or career reinvention. So Zoom turned it into a 99 page document. Gosh. That's wow. Wow. Nice. Yeah, so I had to edit it down to 20. Michael, I felt like I was, what do you call it, the snake shedding skins? I don't know. I don't like that. Get that, you know. I get it over 18 pages. Yeah. Uh, I was, it was like, it was like, I don't know, I unleashed the devil, you know, AI or something, <laughs> the AI transcript model. Nice. Listen, uh, Ann and everyone else, thank you very much. And uh, stay tuned. Season five is is uh, in the process of being hatched. So uh, stay tuned. All right. Thank you, you can't give everyone. us any details Thanks, yet. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Ian. We'll stay Thank, tuned. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mike. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.